Hello and welcome to Academus. My name is Dr. Nick Slayman. I'm a pediatric intensivist at the Nemours DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. Today, we're going to be going over the Pediatric Airway Readiness Simulator. In this virtual reality immersive simulation, we'll go over some key components that'll help get you ready for one of the most stressful pediatric procedures there is, airway intubation in a patient with impending respiratory failure. We'll go over all the equipment needed to instrument the airway, as well as some techniques for how the room should be set up, how the patient be, should be set up to maximize your success. So to start with, you see we have a pediatric patient, probably somewhere around five years old, maybe about 20 kilograms. The bed height is probably the first thing that you should take note of in the pediatric ICU. You'd like to raise it to your level of comfort so that you don't have to bend and stoop too much when you're instrumenting the airway. The patient themselves, you'd like to make sure that they're as close to the head of the bed as possible so that, again, you don't have to kind of reach down to get their airway. Now, pediatric patients have a large head relative to the size of their body. Making sure their head position is optimal to be able to bag mask ventilate as well as instrument the airway with an endotracheal tube is key. And making sure that happens is sometimes easier said than done. So because of this relatively large head to the size of the body, we often need to use some adjuncts. So a rolled towel, a folded up blanket placed underneath the shoulders to then be able to lift the head into what's called a gentle sniffing position will open the airway for maximum success. A pediatric patient whose chin is too far down and close to the chest or a pediatric patient whose head is extended too far backwards will both have an airway that is almost impossible to instrument. So kind of bringing their head into that gentle sniffing position, putting that roll behind their shoulders, sometimes in a small baby you'll have to put a gel-filled donut behind their head to keep them in that sniffing position and open their airway up. Some of the other adjuncts you can use is your hands itself. So kind of the jaw thrust and chin lift position, you can see here, my index fingers would be on the bony prominence of the jaw. I would tilt their head back towards me. And at the same time, using my other three fingers, I can do a jaw thrust to lift the tongue back and out of the way of the airway. The tongue, just like the head being relatively large for the size of the body, the tongue in a pediatric patient is often large for the size of the mouth. And there's usually lots of secretions. So having that kind of positioning where you jaw thrust, chin lift, and a gentle sniffing position will give you your best chance for success. Some of the adjuncts that we need to have, we should go over. So having a bag and mask that fits comfortably over the nose and mouth of the patient is key. Here in this simulation, you can see we have a self-inflating bag. The tensile strength of the plastic walls as you squeeze it to deliver air will refill automatically. And this blue hose can be attached to the green oxygen and you can deliver 100% oxygen through the bag and mask. In pediatrics, we often use a balloon or non-self-inflating bag because it gives us a sense of what the lungs are doing as the patient takes each breath as you apply continuous positive airway pressure. So even if they were covered up with a blanket, you could still see the bag opening and closing and inflating and would give you a sense of what their respiratory effort and drive is like. However, the non-self-inflating or Mapleson bag is just as good. Again, the size of the mask, you want to be able to comfortably cover the nose and the mouth, but not kind of be so big that it's covering the entire face, covering the eyes. The mask itself often has a little bit of a syringe tip that you can apply and give a little more or less air into the mask so that it inflates or deflates for your comfort. So in addition to bag and mask, our patient would be stripped and put into a gown. They would have monitoring attached. As you can see here in our uh, VR scenario, we have a monitor. Patient's heart rate is 144, so often children with respiratory failure or impending respiratory failure will be tachycardic. That could be several reasons, fever and infection, dehydration, or recent albuterol administration. You can see in our scenario, the patient has a saturation of 87%. 88% or so is about the minimal lowest acceptable SAT will take in a pediatric patient because that's where you start to fall off the oxygen dissociation curve to be able to deliver oxygen from the hemoglobin, hemoglobin molecules to the tissues. So in addition to bag and mask and monitoring, we want to have suction. You can see at the end of the bed, we have a yank arrow suction with suction tubing hooked up. And on the front of our boom system, we have a suction uh, set up with a trap. You can dial up the vacuum pressure 
to have a little bit of suction or a lot. Usually you want to have it on medium. They're often divided into a uh, red, yellow, and green, kind of red for danger zone, green for um, the lowest, and yellow for the middle. You want to be somewhere in the green to yellow. Here at the side of the bed, I have a example of a Yankauer suction. So this is a rigid suction. It's fairly wide in terms of its caliber. Just like at the dentist's office, you can kind of clear the mouth and some of the posterior pharynx. I'll often also have a flexible suction that I could pass into the nair or deeper into the trachea and do an NT or nasotracheal suctioning in my patient. Let's talk a bit about bag and mask position. So once you've placed it over the face, your left hand will be delivering the oxygen breaths. You want to bag the chest enough to make the chest rise and fall with each inhalation and exhalation. The mask and properly masking the patient is very important. So using your thumb and index finger, you form the classic C shape. With your other three fingers, you have the E shape. The C goes around the mask itself and applies pressure to the mask. The fingers that make the E shape will grip that bony prominence, so you don't want to be on the jugular carotid sheath. You don't want to be midline on the trachea. You want to grab the jaw, rotate the patient's face back into that sniffing position, and do a jaw thrust and chin lift maneuver to get the tongue out of the way. Staying along the jaw, you're able to do that. In bigger patients, sometimes we'll have a person do the masking for us. So I'll hold the mask with two hands, so a double C and E position, and have someone else squeeze the bag for me. But in a small patient, it's not uncommon to be able to bag the patient with your left hand, mask them, get their head into the proper position, do a jaw thrust, and get their tongue in the proper position, and mask them with your uh, one hand. And again, delivering breaths to see the chest rise is the best way to bag the patient assuring yourself that you have good oxygenation and ventilation happening. Now your pulse oximeter in most pediatric ICUs will have a mode where you can turn it into an audio. So even if this monitor was not in my direct line of sight and I'm focusing on bagging or intubating the patient by looking down, I'm not going to be looking up at the pulse ox. I can hear the tones. Higher pulse ox beeps more rapidly as the patient's saturation starts to fall, telling you you need to hurry up, get the breathing tube in the beeping will get slower. So beep, 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 gets much slower and you know the patient's desaturating. The other clue may be that you're looking at the patient's lips, you see them pink, and then they become uh, become pale, then they become dusky and blue. So you know you have to hurry up. So having proper monitoring, bag and mask, oxygen source, suction, multiple different kinds of suction if possible are kind of our key initial setup. Um, for pediatric airway readiness. Let's talk about some of the equipment itself that could be an adjunct. So being able to effectively bag mask the patient may be more important than being able to put a breathing tube in. You can always get an extra person, an expert anesthesiologist, for example, to be able to help you. But if you can't bag the patient until they get there, you're often in trouble. So this is an oral airway. It's kind of a J shape. Here's a large and a small. We would like to measure from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw to assure that we have the right size. Now, this can be put in upside down and flipped. It can be put in with the right hand and the left hand using a tongue depressor, or the left hand can be put into the corner of the mouth and the thumb can be used to lever the mouth open. But generally, I put it in midline. I put it in front ways instead of backwards and flipping it. I clip the tongue out of the way and I place the oral airway in place. Now this provides several different things for you. You can pass a flexible suction catheter through it and clear the airway. And if your tongue, despite good hand positioning, is in the way, this central vent often lets you deliver oxygen in a more effective way and ventilate the patient more effectively. So an oral airway is an absolute lifesaver and a necessary adjunct. And remember, we're measuring from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. This one in my left hand would be way too big for this patient. This one in my right hand is perfect size. And again, it will kind of clear the tongue out of the way, allow you to suction. Another adjunct that's useful, especially in patients that have large adenoidal and tonsillar tissue, is an NP airway. So this is greased up with a water-soluble lube, and then it's placed into the nair. doesn't matter if it's the right or the left nair, but it's placed directly into the patient. Again, it has a port or a vent in the center.
where you could pass a flexible suction through it and then suction more deeply in the tracheal or subglot superglottic area but it will often help you bypass an upper airway obstruction now one other thing to mention between oral airways and NP airways a patient who's semi-conscious a patient who's lightly sedated is likely to allow you to place an NP airway without much fight a patient who is lightly sedated, however, is unlikely to allow you to pass an oral airway. They will gag, they may vomit. Vomiting in the setting of a sedated or semi-sedated patient is a risk factor for airway aspiration, and it's always necessary to have your suction, and if the patient does start to vomit, turn them on their side. One other piece of equipment that we don't have demonstrated here, but can be very valuable, is that in a pediatric patient, as you provide bag mask ventilation, you're getting some of that oxygen and uh, CO2 into the airway itself, which is your goal. But much of it can go into the stomach, and you can see the stomach kind of distend right, be right before your eyes. I will often have a nurse pla uh, place a Salem sump, which is also known as a large French, a 10 French NG tube, into the patient's nair, down into their stomach, and hook it up to a syringe. So as I bag the patient and give breath after breath, some of which goes into the trachea, some of which goes into the belly, he or she at the same time is pulling on that syringe, emptying the stomach of air as fast as I put it in. So remember that even though an NG or Salem sump isn't demonstrated here in this scenario, vital for successful intubation. So let's say that we've gotten to the point where we have our patient effectively sedated and bag mask ventilated. We'd like to talk about our laryngoscope, and I have one kind of floating in front of me here. The laryngoscope is a fancy flashlight, essentially. It has a hinge right here. It folds shut and turns off the light, but when it's in full extension, as you can see here, it has a light that's lit up, and the light helps you see into the trachea. Normally, we want to hold it somewhere in here in our left hand, we want to have an endotracheal tube in our right hand, and I'll talk more about what that entails in a second. I want to do a midline laryngoscopy, so I'm going to open the child's mouth as much as possible by placing my finger in the corner of the mouth and using my thumb to lever their jaw open. I'll place the laryngoscope in the mouth, pulling the tongue out of the way. And then again, the handle of the laryngoscope tells you and your thumb tell you what direction to go. So we don't want to have a procedure where we rock back and potentially damage the teeth and gums. We want to lift in the direction that the handle and our thumb are pointing. So in lifting the soft tissues, the tongue, the epiglottis out of the way, we'll expose the uh, vocal cords. Now the breathing tube has several different pieces that are important to talk about. So you can see that it has this pilot balloon and that the balloon is inflated. We would never insert a fully inflated balloon because it would never pass through the vocal cords. But we do want to test it before we intubate a patient. Make sure that that tube, which will form a seal in the trachea, is not leaking. We want that balloon to be able to be full so secretions and mucus can't drip down into the lungs and cause aspiration. The other piece of this tube that's important is that you can see this rigid wire that runs through the center of the tube. That's called a stylet. So I often will bend the tube into a J shape because pediatric airways are often more anterior than adults. So I'll give this breathing tube a little bit of curve. Of course, I'll have the balloon deflated. I'll have my stylet in place. And what I'll do is hold my breathing tube in my right hand, my laryngoscope in my left hand. I'll expose the airway. I'll usually have an assistant, a resident, a fellow, or a nurse hand me that breathing tube. I'll take it and I'll place it into the patient, up into their mouth to a proper depth. Now let's talk about the depth for one second. So the breathing tubes come in various sizes. We use the age of the patient to determine what size we should use. So age plus 16 divided by four. So let's say this was a four-year-old patient, four plus 16 is 20 divided by four, we would use a 5 tube, okay? Some people will take a half size off for having a uh, balloon cuff on the end of it and say a 4.5 to a 5 tube should be good. How deep do you insert it into the patient is also from a mnemonic. So the diameter of the tube, that 5.0 breathing tube, should be inserted times 3. 5 times 3 is 15. 15 centimeters at the lip or the gum is where you should harness that tube and the tube theoretically would be in the mid trachea and be able to ventilate and oxygenate both the right 
and the left lung equally. Now, once the breathing tube's inserted, you're still going to do some things to try to confirm it's in place. You're going to look. Is the chest rising equally on both sides, or is only one side rising? And it does have a tendency, if you put it in too deep, to track into the right lung. So maybe only the right chest is moving. So you want to look. You want to listen. Just put on your stethoscope and make sure that the breath sounds sound equal on either side. You want to feel. You can put your hand on the chest and make sure that both sides are rising. You want to get a radiograph. And then we have one other piece of equipment here that I want to introduce. So this is the end tidal CO2. So our end tidal CO2 is simply a piece of litmus paper. And the litmus paper comes out of the package in purple. And as carbon dioxide starts to hit that litmus paper, it will turn yellow. So yellow is yes, purple is a problem. Now if this end tidal CO2 has been sitting out too long, it'll turn yellow and stay yellow because it absorbs the CO2 from the air. So it comes in a foil package. You rip it open at the time that you want to do the intubation. You clip this right on the end of the breathing tube when you remove the stylet. You remove the mask from your bag and mask, and you plug it in and deliver oxygen. As CO2 comes out of the patient, it will change the color and tell you that you now have end tidal CO2. So one other piece to talk about with my laryngoscopy, I'm often instrumenting the airway. I'm trying to get the best view possible. I'm going to have someone hand me that breathing tube, but because the pediatric patient's mouth is so small, I may need help. So I really want to kind of lever their mouth as open as possible when I put my scope in, but to get this breathing tube in properly, I want to insert it from the side of the mouth. I may need an assistant to take the side of the um, lip and retract it downward. You may notice that the laryngoscope has a channel down the center of it. That channel is for your eye to look down. It's not for the breathing tube to pass down. So you really don't want to obscure the view. You want to come in from the side, have your ideal view, expose the vocal cords, and bring the breathing tube in from the side with lip retraction. The other trick that some people sometimes use is to have a little bit of cricoid pressure. So I may have my respiratory therapist standing over here, and they may press a little bit on the trachea to drop the vocal cords down into my view if the child is very, very anterior. So at this point, the last piece of equipment to have ready for a potential intubation is to have your ventilator. You can see our ventilator over here to the left-hand side of our boom. Our normal mode of ventilation is called PRVC. It's kind of standard. It stands for Pressure Regulated Volume Control Ventilation. We'll dial in a 6 cc per kilo tidal volume, so based on the child's weight, let's say there were 10 kilos, 60 cc, 6 times 10 would be our target tidal volume. That volume mode, the ventilator is smart, and it will give you 6 cc per kilo every time you need it. It will dial up and down the pressure needed to deliver that 6 cc per kilo tidal volume, so that's the pressure regulated part of it. So if the patient's lungs are very sick and stiff and poorly compliant, it may take a lot of pressure. Maybe you give the patient a dose of Lasix, they diurese, their compliance from the pulmonary circuit becomes better. The ventilator senses that every three breaths and says, well, I took 35 of pressure to give you your 60 cc's per kilo the last time. This time, I might not, might not only need 30 centimeters of water pressure to deliver the same tidal volume. So it's kind of a smart ventilator. It's heated, humidified, and then in a PRVC mode, we'll also set other than a tidal volume, a rate usually based on the child's age. A five-year-old, like in this scenario, probably has a rate between 24 and 28 breaths per minute. We'll start with an FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen at 100%, and we'll quickly wean that down to hopefully a non-toxic level of oxygen below 60 at the very least, hopefully below 40. And then the last setting we usually set is the PEEP, or the positive end expiratory pressure. So healthy people that are walking around can cough, clear their throat, sigh, take a deep breath. Their alveoli stay open all the time, and they're coated with a um, chemical that helps them do that called surfactant. Patients that have bronchiolitis, patients that have pneumonia, patients whose lungs are very sick or abnormal, their lungs tend to collapse, especially at the bases when they lay down. So the ventilator is designed to give them a little bit of a puff of air at the end of every cycled inspiration as they exhale. Right before they get the next breath of inhalation, they get a little puff.
and that's the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure, to keep their lungs inflated, keep them oxygenating well. So FiO2 and PEEP are our two oxygenation parameters on this ventilator. Our two ventilation parameters for carbon dioxide removal are the 6 cc per kilo tidal volume and the rate that you have set. So that brings me to the end of our pediatric airway readiness scenario. Again, as with any tutorial in a catechist, you can immerse yourself in this virtual environment, watch the tutorial as I've given it, and then in the second level of a catechist, turn off the tutorial. Interact with all the different pieces of equipment that I've shown you here, try them all out, practice with them, and then in the third level of a catechist, you can have that kind of sense of changing the environment adding different pieces of equipment that you don't see here, things that you may use in your hospital, changing the scenario. I don't want it to be in the pediatric ICU. Maybe I'd like it to be in the emergency room because that's where I work. So a catechist gives you all those options. Mm -hmm.